My name is Pam Plotkin, and I am director of the Texas Sea Grant College Program, and I am your guest moderator for today because our regular moderator, Tacey Hicks, was unable to join us. She is in Washington, D.C. today, and, um, and hopefully will tell us about that during a, a future webinar. Today, it's my honor and privilege to share with you um, the topic, Introduction to the Federal Government. So last week, we took a look into the state and local government level. And today, we're going to focus on the federal government. And we have two speakers today. The first speaker is going to be Dr. Kenneth Evans, and the second speaker is going to be uh, Meg Thompson, and we are going to uh, introduce them each, um, and then they will give their presentation, and then after their presentation, we will have time for questions and answers, and so if you've got questions while you're listening, please just type that into the Q&A um, box, and, um, and we will field those questions at the end of each of the presentations. So without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Kenneth Evans. He is currently a scholar in science and technology policy at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy in Houston, Texas. He received his Bachelor's of Science in Physics from the University of Virginia and his Master's in Science and PhD in Applied Physics from Rice University. His research focuses on the history and organization of the U.S. federal science advisory and policymaking system with an emphasis on the role of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Welcome, Dr. Evans. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Pamela, and thank you to all the students, um, and thank you for the invitation. I'm really excited to speak with you guys today, and always very excited to talk with students, uh, PhD students. It's not very long ago, I was a PhD student that was looking to break into the policy world, uh, learn more about federal science and technology policymaking, and understand how that whole system worked and how I can help. Um, so as Pamela said, I'm a, I'm a scholar at the Baker Institute. Well, what is a scholar? Um, scholarly, uh, a scholar is just a elderly postdoc um, in my institution. Um, at some point during the last eight years here, I was um, it became embarrassing for me to be called a postdoc anymore, um, and so they gave me a a, a new title, um, and I continue to work kind of in a postdoc, a super postdoc capacity, um, working on my own grants and teaching and hosting students and other things like that. Um, so at the end of the presentation, if you have questions about my position or uh, my interest in policy or how I ended up at this, at the Baker Institute, I'm happy to field those questions. Um, so I wanted to start just by giving a brief introduction to the Baker Institute, what it does and why it does it. Um, the Baker Institute is a academic nonprofit, um, nonpartisan uh, think tank affiliated with Rice University. Um, it mostly does policy research and with the goal of informing state, local, um, and federal policies related to all kinds of different policy topics. So as you can imagine, we're in Houston, so energy policy is a big program. Uh, we've also got a large health and bioscience policy program. Um, and then kind of the founding uh, program of the Baker Institute because of the legacy of James Baker, who was former Secretary of State, Chief of Staff, Secretary of Treasury, somehow he was all three of those things at different times, um, is in foreign policy and, and Middle Eastern policy. Um, so we write reports, we host events, sometimes we host very fancy events to raise money. We hosted President Obama a few years ago. There I am in the back. Uh, this was the closest I got to him before security escorted me off. Um, but yeah, we're, we're a think tank on Rice campus and um, we're there to serve governments, inform government policies, help make recommendations for policy options um, at all levels uh, across national government. Uh, so let's see, I was gonna start uh, with a few takeaways today um, as kind of give a science policy 101 uh, view of you know, who makes decisions, how do they make decisions with relate, relation to the governance of uh, our national science and technology enterprise. 
Um, and then uh, I'm hoping to provide kind of a definition for science policy, talk a little bit about the way that the government approaches science, um, and then end with some career options for how you can get involved now as a graduate student or options um, for fellowships down the line. And then I'll, I'll take some questions. So this kind of be a blitz, policy blitz. But here are my, here are my takeaways. The first is that the federal government is very, very big. Um, the annual appropriations, as Meg will talk about later, uh, for research and development federally funded by taxpayer money is over $150 billion a year. Uh, that's a really big number. Oftentimes difficult for me to wrap my head around for comparison, say the Gates Foundation, which is a very well-known nonprofit, has an annual spending budget of about $3 billion. So the federal government just does so much. I mean, they fund thousands and thousands of research projects, government programs, large-scale institutions, national labs. I mean, a, a lot of universities run on, on government dollars that way uh, for their research. So it's a big, it's a big entity. Um, leading nationally and also leading internationally in the way that it funds science. The second is that science is really important in all three branches of government. So um, sometimes, you know, there's a focus on appropriations and um, the funding of Congress and Congress, uh, uh, the funding of science in Congress, which Meg will talk about. Um, but science also plays a big role in the, in the court system and the executive branch um, and doing all the things that the government does. The second is I, I've put this picture. Maybe if you're if you're into policy or into the history of science, of this uh, 1945 seminal report published by there's a tiny picture of Vannevar Bush, who was a big time figure in the World War II and early Cold War effort um, in terms of driving and creating a national science policy. He wrote this report, 1945, Science: The End for Frontier, that put together what is known as the linear model of innovation policy. The government funds academic research institutions, which do basic research that is then translated to the commercial sector. The commercial sector creates products um, that drive national interests, either things that can be bought and consumed or you know, things that advance other national policy interests like public health or national security, domestic security, um, environmental policy, um, energy policy, things like that. But my point is, is that uh, that system is kind of outdated. Uh, it's been around for about 80 years and it continues to evolve. And that's part of what uh, my role at the Baker Institute is doing is looking at how we can improve the way that the government um, engages with the private sector and engages with universities to make a more inclusive, uh, more effective um, scientific enterprise. And then I'll end with some policy career opportunities. I'm um, of course, at any time, if people have questions, please like, send them in the chat or send them to, to Pamela and I'll try and answer them either now or at the end of the presentation. Um, and then also I wanna say I can provide my email address or Twitter or whatever, people can hit me up to like ask about opportunities. There are a lot of, there are a lot, a lot of opportunities to get involved in state and federal government. It's just a matter of, of finding them and applying to them. Um, so I'm happy to, to be a resource that way. Um, I wanted to start with a, a uh, quick definition of science policy. Policy is, is kind of a funny term because it, it refers to a set of guidelines, but it can also be used and is often used to refer to the way that decisions are made to set those guidelines. So a set of guidelines for creating guidelines. Um, so if someone says, you know, budget policy, that both refers to the actual physical piece of budget that exists, but then also can refer to how decisions are made surrounding uh, the budget. With respect to science policy, typically people refer to kind of two distinct but a little bit overlapping categories. Science, I've got a horrible typo there, science for policy and policy for science. Science for policy basically um, refers to the way that we um, use scientific data and information to inform and develop policy decisions. Policy for science um, usually refers to either funding or regulation of science. And these two things kind of overlap. Say if we want to know more about some horrible chemical that's destroying our planet. Um, can we drive science in that direction to get the data necessary to regulate that chemical? Um, and then, you know, there's often in, in my particular field, we'll talk about the science of science policy, which is how can we create metrics, data, um, a point that we can make about how science can be improved, um, how do we measure scientific output 
and how can we encourage more scientific output in the public interest? So um, in that sense, science I've heard described, science policy I've heard described as a set of tools. What levers can the government pull? What buttons can they push? What, the, what can they do to make science and American, US science um, more efficient, more effective, more inclusive? Um, so if you have questions about that, please put them in, in the chat. Um, that's kind of the how I typically helps me think about science policy. The other thing that helped me think about um, science policy is thinking about just the separation of powers, the three branches of government and their respective roles in governing science, innovation, higher education, anything related to the advancement of new knowledge and its use. Um, so there's three branches, the executive branch, which of course includes the president, the president is part of what is known as the executive office of the president, which is a collection of about three agents, or excuse me, about two dozen agencies um, that do the work. They're all employees of the president. They do the work that he says he's in charge um, and they carry out the work of the government. Um, and of course, the executive branch also includes um, 15 cabinet departments and a number of independent agencies, many of which are deeply involved in federal science and technology policy efforts. I've highlighted a few here in this little bubble, the National Science Foundation, the NASA Institutes of Health, Department of Energy, and of course, the Department of Defense, which spends more than any other uh, single entity on research and development in the government. Um, and the executive branch is at the president's proposal, so uh, disposal. So they do what the president says, but uh, Congress is in charge of writing the law. So the missions of these agencies are created through Congress. Um, a, a key phrase I like to remember is that the president proposes, Congress disposes. So the president sometimes says things that aren't necessarily aligned with the missions that Congress sets out in what are known as the statutes, the laws that, that govern the work of these agencies. If he says something that isn't necessarily aligned with the way that um, Congress intended or what's available for him to do within the Constitution, those statements are then challenged in court. An example would be, for, for instance, um, this past week, um, the Department of Congress and uh, Commerce, excuse me, and uh, President Biden, um, through his direction, are implementing a new set of export controls on certain pieces of semiconductor technology, including uh, a number of restrictions about US citizens working in China. Um, this will almost assuredly, if it has not been already, be challenged in court for its you know, constitutionality. But my guess is that the, the president has the authority to do this. Typically, the president has wide authority with respect to uh, national and domestic security. Um, but there are other things within the judicial system that rely explicitly on science, such forensic science or something like gene patenting, where you need like a lot of scientific information to really make a decision about um, patent law, for instance. Um, and then kind of the fourth branch of, you know, science within the government is independent scientists, academic research community, nonprofit institutions like the Baker Institute that weigh in on things that are important to them and their stakeholders, constituencies, professors, other people that are really interested in this world. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that, about that quite at the end. Um, so yeah, the three branches, separation of powers, they work together, but not always um, in harmony. Um, this plot I like to show just because it's it kind of demonstrates the kind of expansiveness of the US federal research enterprise. Um, so see, you can get the, ex the Office of the President, two very important components of the Executive Office of the President are the Office of Management and Budget, which has a number of functions that are very, very important for the way that science is conducted and how it is funded across the federal government, and the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which I'll focus on for a slide or two. Um, but the idea here is there's a number of, there's 15 cabinet departments, and many of them contain, contain multiple science funding and regulatory agencies. Then there's a number of other science related, heavy, heavy science investment through independent agencies. So it's just a big system. Again, there's like 12 to 15 um, agencies that have like over a billion dollars in research and development budget each year, which is a, a massive amount of number and very difficult to coordinate across all these agencies, cabinets that have these different missions. Um, so it's a complicated system. There's no single science office, department of science that does all things science and technology, innovation, higher education. The closest thing to that is the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which I 
believe I'm talking about here. So um, OSTP, as it's known, is a very unique agency. It has a, it's in the statutes. Um, so uh, short story here, it was created in the like very early Cold War to coordinate growing efforts in science and technology. It did pretty well until um, the beginning of the Nixon administration, where he was really dissatisfied with the way that scientists were treating his decisions. So he just fired a lot of them in the early seven at the start of his second term. Um, the office was resuscitated essentially um, by President Ford um, and instituted into the statutes to say this is what this office does, whereas before it just was floating kind of in the wind. Um, it provides the president with scientific data and analysis and often provides policy options um, related to science and technology. It's run by a person who's known as the president's science advisor, which in most recent administrations has held two distinct roles, which are really important. The first being a, a Senate confirmed position that's responsive to congressional interests in the director of this office is Senate confirmed position. And then an assistant to the president for science and technology, which is a confidential advisor that provides behind closed doors, independent advice to the president on things that are of national interest. So um, there's a new scientific advice, the science advisor. Uh, you can see that she's being sworn in here um, by one of her colleagues. And this just happened last week. I'm, I'm happy to talk at length about the recent history of OSTP um, and its staff, but that might be outside the scope of this presentation. Um, but it does two important things that I wanna point out. The first that it hosts a, um, a number of advisors, independent advisors that are typically very high ranking um, academics in their fields or industry leaders. And they're there to say, you know, tell the president no on some things. They do this not necessarily in public, um, but they're there to say this is really where science gets its voice in the White House to the president is what's known as the president's council of advisors in science and technology. Um, and then it also coordinates, again, this many, many agencies, many cabinet departments through what's known as the National Science and Technology Council, NSTC. And these are both very important bodies that are kind of weedy, um, that are a little bit, um, they don't, they're not like very, they don't have big Twitter accounts that's saying this is what we're doing. They're doing the work of the government very internally uh, within OSTP. Um, so they're very important in terms of their function. I want to just give a statement about the two other big pieces driving White House science policy. Obviously, the president, um, he, they're in charge. Um, so they, they have a number of ways of carrying out the work that they want done. Um, those have differing legal authority. Um, but the president, most of their authority comes from within national security sector. So they have wide, wide authority on immigration decisions. I mean, the, the statutes surrounding immigration are, are very broad um, and the constitution allows for the president to make lots and lots of decisions about immigration policy, basically by themselves. Um, and then of course, with relation to defense efforts and stuff like that, the president is very important. The second um, office is the Office of Management and Budget, which I'm sure Meg will mention, um, which kind of sets um, big strategic with OSTP, um, uh, priorities for the way that science is governed. Um, and then it also has a big regulatory component. Any regulation that comes through, like that's written by any agency goes through OMB um, and is typically not marked up too heavily, but it's still got to go through um, a review by the Office of Management and Budget. Um, I wanted to give before I end a quick example of a science policy. And Meg might spend some time talking about the CHIPS Act um, but I think it's a really good recent example of the way that the, the government works um, and the way that the president sends orders uh, across the government to get things done. Um, so the CHIPS Act uh, was signed into law just, uh, I guess, about two months ago by President Biden. There's a nice picture of him surrounded by a lot of the major stakeholders and people involved in getting this act across the finish line. It started about three years ago with a statement from uh, Senate Majority Leader, now Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, um, who said he wanted to give $100 billion of new money to the National Science Foundation. Well, the annual appropriations for the National Science Foundation currently sit around eight and a half billion dollars. So a hundred billion price tag for this small agency got, peop got people's attention. Three years later, the bill and the original uh, idea for this act, which was basically to make America more competitive uh, with 
emerging countries that are really working in the high technology sector, namely China, um, and and things included uh, not just you know subsidies for um, uh, private industry that was working in the sector, but then also workforce programs, um, changes to the way that um, certain programs work, uh, tax rebates, things like that. It's really big. It ended up being a you know I think well over a thousand pages worth of of bill language, um, and in the final the big core component that was championed by both Changers of Commerce and both parties was this $52 billion subsidy for the domestic semiconductor sector. And all I wanted to show with this um, policy is that it's managed cooperatively by a number of different departments. So, excuse me, the Department of Congress is kind of running the show um, in terms of deciding how to dole out this money, working with private industry, being advised by industry leaders on how this money should be spent. Um, but PCAST, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, and the National Science and Technology Council are both weighing in on this, and their voices are part of the way that these decisions are made. So PCAST is advising on the best way to engage multi-stakeholders in like making sure that lots of different interests are represented in the way that this money is spent. And the National Science and Technology Council will ultimately create a subcommittee um, that annually or biannually reviews the activities of this big program, many, many billions of dollars spent, and says, this is an update. Here's, you know, here's some policy options for making this program a little bit better. Um, and then I, I, I guess I'll end um, this section on saying, you know, people are looking this at kind of a resurgence of industrial policy in, you know, in science and technology. The government, of course, subsidizes lots of other industries, um, but there's there's a heavier hand, I guess, in the way that government is dealing with science in the wake of COVID and recognizing that American strength relies on um, a strong science and technology workforce um, and uh, making sure there's capacity both at universities and in industry to be competitive globally uh, with you know, uh, other countries that are working on, on uh, similar efforts. Um, so people are thinking maybe this is, uh, a longer kind of term in industrial policy. The bill, um, from an academic perspective, sets out very ambitious targets for funding for a lot of the research agencies that fund basic research on campuses. Congress has to step up and pass those budgets in the next few years, but they've been authorized to spend way more money on science across the government. So it's, a, it's an interesting bill and an interesting time to get involved in science. Um, I wanted to just have a slide and then I, you know, I'll, I'll give out my email or, or um, Pamela or Tacey can um, pass it along, but there's a number of opportunities to get involved um, as a graduate student or as an early career researcher um, in government and you know, government adjacent um, organizations. I've listed a few here um, and, and there are many others, um, but I, I've had a number of students go through a number of these programs, um, basically at the, at the National Academies of Science and Engineering and Medicine. They have a graduate research program you can do as a graduate student for a semester if you can convince your advisor to leave and go to CC for a little while. The American Advancement of Association, or the American Association for the Advancement of Science has a number of fellowship opportunities and other professional organizations do as well to get your foot into government. I'd like to kind of point out two student-led initiatives that I think are really interesting um, and very, very active. The Engaging Scientists and Engineers and Policy Coalition, uh, which has a great newsletter, um, but then also kind of is there to encourage and support early career researchers that really want to do community work um, and science advocacy locally in their, in their government. And the National Science Policy Network is a really cool, very quickly growing network of graduate student associations. Uh, Rice has a chapter now um, that is um, has students that are very interested in getting into policy, um, organizing policy-related events on their campus, providing support for people that do want to apply for government positions after they graduate, things like that, and also hosting events, career symposia, things like that. Um, uh, much more um, it, much more uh, resources available than, say, 10 years ago when I was looking into this um, career path. Um, so th those are resources available. And then my final slide, I just want to plug, if you want to learn more about OCP and PCAST, we're hosting an event next month on November 9th at noon. It'll be recorded. The webinar will be available. We've got three really good speakers, a former member of PCAST, former director of OCP, Neil Lane, another vice chair of PCAST, Maxine Savick. 
who is very, very active during the Obama administration, has quite a lot to say about PKS. And what we're, what we're doing is demonstrating uh, the recent work we've been doing on, on OSTP and PCAS, and also um, highlighting a, a public archive for building um, digitally um, to be a resource for scholars, students, interested people in the history of federal science policymaking. Um, I'm happy to talk at length about um, that project. But I provided a link here, and I can do so in the chat to register. The registration is open; it's free, um, and we'll be having a discussion on on federal science policymaking. So hopefully, some of you are interested. And with that, I will uh, I think end my presentation and then op open for questions. So please, um, I'm not seeing a chat, but I'll, I'll ask um, Meg um, for um, and Pamela for if there's questions that are have come into the chat. Um, at this time. So thank thank you again for listening to me talk and the opportunity to speak. Um, and I welcome any questions that you have. Thank you so much. I can hear the applause and Ali <laughs> is going to field the questions. So Ali, uh, please, please sling the questions at Dr. Evans. Sure. So right now we're not seeing anything in the chat. Um, as a reminder, you can also raise your hand and I can allow you to unmute if you would like to ask your question live. Um, but right now we don't have anything. I'm here and I'm ready to go. This is Meg. So maybe, maybe I'll spur on questions that Dr. Evans can field. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, we will get back to the questions after Meg's presentation. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you Meg Thompson, the co-founder and partner of Federal Science Partners. Meg is a native Washingtonian, uh, a graduate of the College of the Holy Cross, who has done graduate coursework at both George Washington University and University of Virginia. She has spent 18 years as professional staff on both the Senate and House Appropriations Committees for both Republican and Democratic majorities, and she has advised clients on the inner workings of the Congress for 14 years. Prior to founding Federal Science Partners in 2014, Ms. Thompson was a partner at two previous firms where she represented several scientific institutions, associations, and hospital systems. In the private sector, Ms. Thompson was a director of communications for the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, guiding the foundation's congressional and corporate communications. She was also previously a lobbyist for health and medical research clients, including the Shearing Flow Corporation and the campaign for medical research dedicated to the successful doubling of the NIH budget between 1997 and 2002. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Meg. Thank you so much, Pam. Um, I, I like hearing that laundry list. It reminds me in my earlier days how much more energy I had. Um, Pam, did you want me to share my screen to start the presentation? I can certainly try. Yes, please. All right. Bear Fingers with crossed. Me. Bear with me, everybody. I don't have a PhD, so I may not get this straight. All right. Share my screen. And here it is. Okay, share. All righty. Yay. Play from start. Okay, so this is me, Federal Science Partners. Um, let me just move this along. So while um, Dr. Evans was talking, I quickly put to, pulled up this slide so that everybody could have an understanding of um, a, a pictorial understanding. So this first, the source of this, because you can get sources um, and, and pictorial displays and graphs and charts from anywhere, um, some political, some not. Um, my favorite source as a former um, House and Senate appropriations staffer is the Congressional Budget Office. It is a nonpartisan organization of the federal government that uh, counts up uh, what we spend and scores bills, which is a fancy word for making sure that a, a bill um, provides the correct amount of funding and derives the correct amount of funding from the U.S. Treasury. So the, the part of the federal government that we're discussing today is part of discretionary spending. So if you look at this pie chart, the bulk of it is mandatory spending. What is mandatory spending? That's 
entitlement programs, Social Security, Medicare. Those are the big, that is where the most of the federal government's money comes from. Then you've got the discretionary spending there at the bottom, which is $1.6 trillion. So, so a much smaller slice of the pie. Discretion, mandatory spending is, is called mandatory because once the law is written, it's sort of on autopilot. So you may have heard in the news or read over time, oh gosh, this country, we need to change our social security laws. We need to change the amount of money that we spend for Medicare, Medicaid. Those um, are extraordinarily controversial and political programs and decisions, or rather the, the decisions are political. It's very hard to change the amount of money spent for mandatory spending. Discretionary spending, on the other hand, is something that is done every single year by the Congress, and it is seemingly a bit easier to make those changes, probably because it's annual, and if you make a mistake one year, you can fix it the following year. I'm gonna to advance to the next screen while we're on this to give you the details of what is in um, discretionary spending. So you see here, I have to move myself off this screen. You see here, um, the you've got 1.6 trillion is the total amount and then that what does that come from non-defense programs is 0 0.9 so a very small part of our total discretionary spending is non-defense this is funding for nasa this is funding for the executive office of the president where ostp sits this is funding for nih this is funding for NOAA. all of these giant science agencies which are so important to us and so important to so many are a very very small sliver sliver of total federal expenditures so those are just two slides i added now i'm going to go back to what i had prepared for today except for nothing is moving okay so just starting with the federal federal budget cycle and i want to just pause there for a second with the title of this slide the cycle um, one of the best and worst parts of working for the House and Senate Appropriations Committees, where I worked um, uh, a total of 15 years, is that every day you, you land in a certain part of the calendar cycle. It, it is an annual process, the appropriations process. So no matter how hard I wanted to work or didn't want to work, I had work that had to be done. This process continued. And um, for my purposes, it begins on the first Monday in February, which is when the administration submits their budget request to the Congress. But that process started much earlier. So on this slide here, you see that it begins with agency planning. So really at the beginning of a calendar year, agencies are beginning already to plan for what they need for the following fiscal year. Now let me pause there for a second. What is the United States government fiscal year? It runs from October 1st to September 30. So let's say we're, you know, I don't wanna to take today for an example. Let's say we're in the middle of April. The agencies are both running their programs at the same time as they are anticipating what they want to spend for the following year. And because they need to submit that information to the Office of Management and Budget by August. The Office of Management and Budget then reviews that between August and November and generally around Thanksgiving they do something called pass back where they provide their recommendations back to the agencies. They sort of tussle a little bit where the agency, no, 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 I need more money in order to find a cure for cancer and OMB says, sorry, we don't have enough money to give you. We've got to spend money on roads and bridges over at the Department of Transportation or housing over at Housing and Urban Development. And so the amount of money is ultimately decided by OMB and they package it together in something called the federal budget request to Congress, which comes out that first Monday in February. It's highlighted here in red at the bottom of this slide. That's when the budget, the appropriations process starts on the Hill. And from there, staff like myself read literally they look like phone books but they are also now available online they we review the budget requests the increase and the decreases that are requested we 
have advocates that come in and talk to us, science policy advocates, cancer policy advocates. I mentioned transportation. State agencies will come in and talk about the need for more funding. And we review all of those those requests along with individual Congress people come in, the staff come into the offices and make their requests. There are 12 subcommittees in both the House and the Senate Appropriations Committees. So a staffer like myself is assigned to a particular subcommittee. I worked on three different subcommittees during my career. I worked on the subcommittee which funds the Departments of Labor, Education and Health and Human Services. I next worked on the subcommittee that funds the Department of Homeland Security. And I finally worked on the subcommittee that funds the Departments of Commerce, Justice, and Science, the science agencies, not the Department of Science per se. Let me go to my next slide here. So here is a pictorial of sort of the process. And I want to note at the bottom that both of these slides were derived from um, information from AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. They are another organization with really terrific resources. So you see over here this sort of circular um, between the White House, OMB, which two agencies within the White House, the Office of Management and Budget is, you know, sort of the, the bean counters for the president, the executive office of the, of the president. And then, as mentioned earlier, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which provides advice and counsel to the president with respect to science and technology policy. They provide um, information and influence down to the agencies, as well as the agencies provide up to them information about needs and opportunities. Then in February, the administration presents their budget request to Congress, and then the congressional process starts. And here's what that looks like. The budget committee, although this isn't something that is done on a very regular basis anymore, but the budget committee writes something called a budget resolution, which sets up the total amount of money that will be spent and um, provides targets, which are called budget functions for how that money will be spent. They provide that their recommendation to the appropriations committees. At the same time, authorizing committees provide uh, advice they call the views and estimates and they write legislation which then informs the appropriations committees. And then the appropriations committees write 12 spending bills. So let me just pause here for a second. When you think of committees on Capitol Hill, there are hundreds of committees in the House and the Senate. And most committees, except for a few committees, which are sort of governed between both bodies, most committees have a parallel committee in the House and the Senate. And then within each committee, the staff are divided between the majority staff and the minority. Currently, as you may know, the majority in both bodies are held by the Democratic Party. And so the members of that party then sit on that committee as well as the minority members, but the number of majority members is therefore bigger in relation to how many members are sitting in the Senate and in and in the Congress and in the House of Representatives. So there are all these authorizing committees, different types of authorizing committees, House Committee on Science, Committee on Commerce, Senate Committee on Commerce, to, to name two. But there is only a single appropriations committee in, in each body. And then there are subcommittees within that. So it's actually a very small committee doing a big, big piece of work. So let me go to the next, next slide. Why isn't my slide working? Hang on. Okay. So here's another sort of graphic showing you the budget process. We have how, do, how does an individual um, subcommittee review requests and how do they build a bill? They start, as I said, we start our work on the first Monday in February and we, you know, we have what is the, the president's request, which you can see up here and sort of at the two o'clock point, the agency's budget, budget request is transmitted to an individual subcommittee. We're also influ influenced by last year's appropriation that we learn from the from the agencies if that appropriation was sufficient or if that appropriation was insufficient. We get requests from other appropriators. You see that up at like one o'clock. Up at 11 o'clock, other legislators request. So these are other members of Congress, not necessarily on our committee. Party leadership, very influential. If Nancy Pelosi tells the Senate Appropriations Committee that a certain program is important to her, that is probably a program that is going to be funded very well that year. And then 
at about the mm, eight o'clock, I guess it is, you see the bill size. This is called the 302B allocation. That's just a fancy word for the amount of money that the subcommittee can spend in that fiscal year. So the first thing that we do is we, as I said, we have all these individuals coming to us, emailing us, sending in letters that are, we hold hearings to review the budget. We have agency heads come in and they will present their priorities and then sit through questions where the members of Congress pummel them often and ask them, why are you asking so much for this? Why aren't you asking so much for that? So that is the review process that takes place genuinely, generally between February and May of any calendar year. In, in sort of the June, July timeframe, we finally have time to write the bill and report and we meet in subcommittee. And this is, you know, you've probably seen movies about Congress, the, you know, sort of Mr. Smith goes to Washington is maybe the, the oldest classic movie. And you'll see a big fancy hearing room and a, and a dais, which, you know, sort of they're up on a raised platform, which forms a U so that those in the audience or those watching from home can see. Um, Democrats on the left, on the right side, no, the left side, Republicans on the right side sitting there and they vote on, they vote on the, the bill that has been presented to them and then they make offer amendments to that vote. Once that bill is passed, the subcommittee bill, there is a scheduled meeting of the full committee. So people who are members of the full committee are, it's a much larger committee comprised of, as I mentioned, the 12 subcommittees. So then the, you have the exact same process in the full committee. So that is the beginning of the congressional process. This is an example of the National Science Foundation's fiscal year 2023 budget, just so you can understand the puts and takes on what has happened with respect to the fiscal year 22 as relation to 23. If you look at the blue bar on the left-hand side, that is that is last year's or really the current fiscal year that we're sitting in. That is the amount of money that has been provided to NSF for all of those different items. The 23 budget request is what came in from the administration on the first Monday in February. And then the yellow is the House recommendation, which is after that you go through that process and it is voted out of the House committee, the House bill, and then the Senate bill. You can see a little bit here more detail down below. I will tell you for our purposes of this current fiscal year that, that we're considering working on the fiscal year 23 bill, which um, fiscal year 23 um, just began on October 1. The Senate did not go through that process that I showed you before of subcommittee and full committee vote. Um, they released their bills and we'll get into that a little bit in a few minutes. Um, so we've talked about this a little bit already. The House advanced their individual appropriations bills this year. The House passed what is called a minibus on the House floor before the August recess. So in, in, in recent years, I started working on appropriations matters in 1992. I've now aged myself before your eyes. Um, it was very rare back then, not uncommon, but rare, that appropriations were not completed by the end of the calendar year, by the end of September 30. Because if you don't finish your appropriations bill and have it signed into law by the president by September 30, then the federal government literally cannot operate the next day on October 1. But as uh, it seems that there is a little bit less compromising in Congress these days than there were than there was 30 years ago, it is becoming less common for appropriations bills to be compromised and worked out on an annual basis. And so they are extended through a process called a continuing resolution. Another phenomenon in recent years is the so-called minibus. In order to get appropriations bills done, the appropriations committee will package bills together. So they'll take a bunch of bills together and pass them on block because there are possibly in there bills that will, some bills that majority of members like, and then you can sneak in a more difficult bill, have one vote rather than taking a number of votes. Votes. So the minibus that is referred to here was voted on by the full House of Representatives. It, 
it funded six bills, and we'll get to those bills on the next slide. The Senate did not advance any bills this summer from either through either subcommittee, full committee, or to the Senate floor. And this was true of last year, too. As you all know, currently the Senate is divided 50-50 Republican-Democrat. But with the vice president casting a vote as a Democrat, she is a member of the Senate for voting purposes. So then it is a majority Democratic. But in subcommittee, that she does not, and in full committee, she does not cast a vote. And so it is very likely that those bills would be not be voted out. They would fail because there would be a tie. So for the past two years, the appropriations committees have not done gone to subcommittee and full committee. They have not wanted there to be this public display of the majority party, which is a very slim majority, not being able to follow through with their appropriations bill in committee. This releasing that I mentioned here simply means that the committee staff wrote their 12 appropriations bills and posted the bill language and the report language, the explanatory report, on the Senate Appropriations Committee website. It is not a legal document. It has not passed the Senate. It has not passed even the Senate committee. And it has certainly not been signed into law yet. So it is it is a document out there for display purposes, but it will actually be the starting point for the negotiations between the House and the Senate. We'll get to that. So here is a summary of the minibus. I list for you here the 12 subcommittees that exist in both the House and the Senate. And for purposes of, of this display, I've crossed out the committees, committees whose bills are not included in the minibus. So the ones that are not crossed out are the bills that were funded. And so you can go through them and see that they're in some ways the less controversial bills. You know, obviously, the Subcommittee on Defense, this is, you know, the largest, the largest bill. And, you know, what we fund, how much we support the warfighter is generally a bipartisan issue. What what becomes un takes a while to settle is how much of an increase the Department of Defense gets um, there. And so there are also political issues in some of these bills. Subcommittee on Interior has a lot of um, animal rights issues in it. The um, Labor, Health, and Human Services bill also has a number of issues in it pertaining to abortion and fetal tissue research, which annually have some controversial amendments or language and make that bill harder to pass. So what is a continuing resolution? I mentioned since that a few minutes ago. It's also called a CR. When the federal government, when when the federal government is not funded by October one, when I and people like me today working on the House and Senate Appropriations Committees, when our work is not passed by Congress by September 30, there are two choices. Either the government shuts down, as has happened in the past, most recently during the Trump administration and many administrations prior. It also shut down during the Clinton administration for, I think, a brief time in the Obama administration. But a CR keeps the federal government open at last year's funding, which means if you can think of your own budget, you know you know that food prices has, have gone up this year. Possibly your rent has gone up this year. So if everything is the same, that means you're gonna have to cut something elsewhere. So if agencies are being funded at the same level, they're probably during this time period from now until December 16th, not going to be able to fund and uh, perform the duties that they funded and performed last year. The other piece of this legislation that was passed on September 30 was a supplemental for Ukraine. Um, and you can see here a little bit more detail on the votes in the House and the Senate and also with respect to the $12.35 billion for Ukraine. I believe this is the third supplemental um, funding for Ukraine. Um, the term supplemental means it is a supplement to ongoing federal appropriations. In this case, there is money for the U.S. Agency for International Development, and most of the money goes for the U.S. Department of Defense 
to um, provide weaponry to Ukrainian forces. FY23 appropriations. So what is going to happen um, at the end of this year? So we have a big thing happening, as many of you know, in November. On November 8th, we have a highly contested midterm election. So the midterm refers to the fact that this is the election that occurs in the midterm of a presidency. So um, President Biden was elected two years ago. This is the, the mid of his term. And it statistically looks like, if you look back past his prologue, that the House will possibly flip from being a Democratic majority to a Republican majority. As well, it looks like there is a chance that the Republicans could gain a majority in the Senate. And so this election is very, very contested. In, in my experience working in politics in Washington in 30 years, I have never seen a midterm election um, with this much attention to it. Pretty much since the start of the Biden administration, January um, a year ago, everybody was already focused on the midterm election. And that has meant that a lot of bills and activity that could have happened are framed by those politics. So for instance, I mentioned here, so first let me stop, sorry. I mentioned here a lame duck. The lame duck term of Congress refers to the members of Congress who are not reelected. So either they have announced that they're retiring by the end of the year, or they were not reelected. So on November 9th, those members of Congress who were not reelected, as well as those who have announced their retirement between November 9th and January, the beginning of January, those members are lame duck members of Congress, which is a, is a arcane term for they have a bit more flexibility in how they vote because they're not looking to get reelected. They sort of have can vote either their conscience or they can vote, you know, how how their constituents wish or they can vote how their constituents don't wish. And so it's a time when a lot of legislation often gets done behind closed doors. This is a big DC term of art. Um, because those members of Congress are a bit more free to participate in the legislative process because they're not scared of losing their job. Um, Senator Manchin from West Virginia has proposed a big energy and climate bill that may be voted upon um, this December, um, as well as we have recently had the Bipartisan Innovation Act, which was discussed, and reconciliation. There could be another reconciliation bill. We're not going to get into reconciliation today because that is an arcane process, but I'm happy to discuss it with anyone offline. If the House or the Senate flip, meaning if the, the majority party changes, we could have another continuing resolution. So this current continuing resolution keeps the federal government funded until December 16th. If the House or the Senate change in the majority, there, the Senate and the House have have a responsibility to get this uh, between now and December 16th, they have to finish the appropriations process. Well, what if they can't? Or what if they don't want to? There is a chance, let's assume for a second that both bodies become Republican. They may say, let's wait until January when we are the majority party and we can quickly reorder how we want fiscal year 23 money to be spent. That has happened in the past. This year, there is a very good chance, and we hope that the federal government will be fully funded by December 16th. And the reason is the Senate chairman and ranking member, Senator Leahy from Vermont, who's the Democratic chair of the Appropriations Committee, and Senator Richard Shelby from Alabama, who's the Republican ranking member, meaning the highest ranking minority party, they are both retiring at the end of this year they would like to see their last bill done. They would like to have it be signed into law. As well, the, the presumed majority leader, if the Republicans take over, um, uh, Kevin McCarthy from California, he has articulated that he would like to start afresh. And so he would like the appropriators to finish their process. I'll go to my next slide. Um, let, here's just a touch. I think this was previously touched on by Dr. Evans. Some of the recent legislation supporting science R&D, 
um, this is, you know, today my talk was a little bit about more about appropriations, but here are some of the big areas um, that were funded. You see some big dollar signs here was mentioned earlier, the Chips and Science Act, the Inflation Reduction Act was um, just, I say just, it was in August past, but the administration has still not, um, agencies have not really started letting that money, meaning they haven't started putting it out for award. But one of the things that I do want to mention here is that the National Science Foundation did not fare very well. So in President Biden um, was sworn in in January and on March 31st, 2021, he announced um, a plan called the Build Back Better Plan. And he had all sorts of investments that were infrastructure related. Their hard infrastructure, roads and bridges, soft infrastructure, child care proposals to support people being able to work, and science R&D, which I personally and many of you believe probably is a major driver of the U.S. economy. We have been a leader in science R&D. That's why people from all over the world come to our universities for education. And he requested $180 billion for science R&D. It wasn't very specified. He had some generalized areas, including I think it was $45 billion for the National Science Foundation. Unfortunately, in the two big um, bills that grew out of that proposal, that is the Inflation Reduction Act, which was passed in August, and the um, bipartisan infrastructure bill that was passed in December of 2021, neither of those had major funding for the National Science Foundation. Now, the National Science Foundation does have a new directorate in it, which you can see sort of in the top here of the chart, the TIP directorate, the Technology and Innovation Directorate. And that is a, a, a large new directorate within NSF. Unfortunately, the total size of NSF did not grow very much to accommodate that new directorate. And so some of the basic research funding directorates at NSF um, were either flat funded or in some cases reduced a little bit in order to move money over into this new technology directorate. We really need NSF to grow in order to keep pace with um, you know, our competitors around the world and to continue to support the engine of scientific research in this country. This is just a quick glance at the congressional calendar so you have an idea of sort of what what happens. Um, the, the blue is a time when just the House is in session. The, the purple that is the majority of the screen here shows you when both the House and the Senate are in session. The burgundy is the Senate's in session, the House is not. And then the green are the federal holidays. Now, just because a body is not in session, so therefore sort of all the white or all the, the burgundy, when only the Senate is in session and the House isn't, that does not mean that the members of Congress are on vacation, as is sometimes portrayed. That is a time when they are either doing committee work, and so they're not on the floor of the House or the Senate, or they are at home in their districts, meeting with constituents, learning what their constituents need, or, or holding hearings in their districts as well, and frankly, campaigning. I mean, members of the House are constantly campaigning to keep their job because they could lose their job every other year. And, you know, every six years in the Senate, they are campaigning as well. And so those are what this just shows you the, the sort of is a pictorial display of how actually little time there is in D.C. for the passage of legislation. Um, this is just a bit more on the key dates. So right now we already have passed through September 30, which was the end of the fiscal year, as I've mentioned. We're under a continuing resolution through December 16th. I've mentioned the midterm elections on November 8th. And then following that, we begin the so-called lame duck Congress. If the House or Senate flip, expect another CR. And then the presidential primaries, that's going to begin soon. We're going to start talking about who's going to run for president from both bodies, parties rather, and all of the primaries that will occur. So really the 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 elected politics has a pretty big influence on the daily business of Congress because those same members of the House and the Senate are 
trying to keep their jobs so that they can do their jobs at sort of the same time. And then this is my final slide, which just um, how is legislation influenced? I think this was touched on by Dr. Evans earlier as well. I just wanted to go over a, a couple ways. So first and foremost for appropriations, and I should have, the heading should be how is appropriations legislation um, influenced? The fiscal environment. So what is it like across the country and in, and in a particular member of Congress's district right now? The inflation numbers are growing, and so that will impact whether or not a member of Congress is going to feel comfortable voting for increases for certain programs that he or she may or may not find is necessary. All politics is local. And so while I'm voting in Washington for something that is a national program, does this really benefit my home district? So for instance, NIH and NSF both track how much money is spent. Um, they don't track rather, but they can track how much money is spent in individual congressional districts and in individual states. So if I'm from a con congressional district that does not have a big research university in it, I'm probably less likely to be a big supporter of NIH or of NSF because my constituents, my voters, don't work at that university. They work in other industry. Public interest. So what does my, what do my constituents and what does the general public have concern for right now? Over the past couple of years, health has been a major concern as we all have been impacted by the pandemic. And so funding for health research as well as health therapeutics has been a big concern. Competitiveness. How are we faring in an economic way um, against on the world stage? Those are also influences. Then my personal legislator interest. So I mentioned a few minutes ago that if I don't have a big research university in my district, I may not be inclined to recommend funding a lot of money for the departments of um, health, NIH, or National Science Foundation. But you'd be surprised how many members of Congress become very committed to those agencies when something personal happens to them. For instance, if they or their family member has been impacted by a specific disease. It is, um, it is very, it is incredible to see how personal that can get with individual members of Congress. Party preferences. So if I'm a member of a particular party, it, 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 it guides what I think should or should not be funded. And finally, getting that bill to pass. So is it going to be hard to pass this piece of legislation? I'm going to support pieces of legislation and, and programs within the appropriations process that are more likely to get passed. Am I really going to dig in and, and be inclined to follow and to fight for a program that my constituents don't really care a lot about, but that I also know is going to be an uphill battle? That makes it harder for me to want to get engaged there. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. I am very happy to answer questions. I hope that, that was somewhat illustrative and, and helpful to you all. We do have um, one question in the chat, and this is from Teresa. Um, she wants to know, she said on your agency slide, um, NOAA was not listed. Would NOAA fall under that term or umbrella as well? Yes, and I should have listed Noah. I'm sorry. I, you know, I was borrowing from other, other. You know, I think that those slides, the, I, the slides that you're referring to, was either the slides done by the Congressional Budget Office or the slides that were I um, used information from AAA us. Noah is definitely an agency that would fit in there. Thank you. Um, and then it looks like that was our last question. Um, so I know Dr. Plotkin had some questions. Uh -oh. Yeah, these are questions that folks sent in ahead of time. And so I'm going to ask the questions and, and let uh, either one of you take a stab at them. Uh, and um, so this one seems like it's, it's best suited for Dr. Evans. Um, what level of training do the people in the Office of Science and Technology Policy have? What kind of degrees and what kind of experience? Yeah, gr great question. Um, we've been tracking this. I mean, most, most, most people, um, OCP is a very small office. Um, so it employs something like 
40 to 50 full-time government employees. Most of those people have PhDs. Um, those people are typically, the way that OSTP is organized, they're looking for specialists. They're looking for people that have, you know, PhDs, experience in research on particular subject matter experts that like OSCP deals with. So for something like environmental policy or, um, you know, oceans or something, you know, uh, fisheries, things with related to like NOAA or NOAA's work, right? If they want people with um, backgrounds, highly technical backgrounds, I would say something like 80% of the like key staff have PhDs. Maybe that's not, I'm not sure, but I, it's, it's well over 50. Um, like any agency, it's split between say people that are in Senate confirmed positions or have um, assistant director or deputy assistant director titles. Most of those people have PhDs. And then there's a lot of support staff that also support that work. But a lot of those support staff also have PhDs. So it's, it's a very um, intellectual place is my understanding is that they many of the people that work in OSTP um, have have very technical scientific backgrounds. Great. Well, while we've still got you near the camera and the microphone, what got you personally into science policy? Hmm. Um, so I'm sorry, Dr. Evans, can I I'll go first? Yeah, yeah please. So I um, I grew up in the Washington DC area. My father worked for the Department of Justice for 40 years. So I had an innate reverence for public service. Um, I did an internship uh, during college and then was invited to interview with the Senate Appropriations Committee. And so at, when you're invited to be interview with the Senate Appropriations Committee, you sort of take what they give you. Fortunately, I um, was offered an opportunity on the subcommittee that funds the Departments of Health and Human Services. And I was very interested in um, biomedical research. I just thought that it was just an, an incredible opportunity for me to learn more about how um, bills and agencies are funded. And so I um, had that opportunity as well. My mother had um, breast cancer twice during her lifetime. She's still alive. And so I had a personal connection to it as well. Um, I moved subcommittees later in my career, not of my own um, design. Uh, I had uh, bosses who said, you'd be great at Homeland Security being in charge of FEMA right after Katrina, to which I said, no, I would not enjoy that. That is working 24 hours a day. Um, so for, for me, it became, it was um, personal interest, but also opportunity. And I think that that is true of many people on, Cap on the Capitol Hill side. It is, those jobs are very hard to get. I think um, Dr. Evans mentioned 40 people in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. If you think about that for a second, the entire federal government's science and technology policy is, is governed by or, and recommended by 40 people. I mean, that's incredibly small. And the same is true on the appropriations committees. They're incredibly small staffs. And so you take what you can get. But, but for me, it was personal interest as well as opportunity. Thank you so much. Dr. Evans, how about you? Because you, you started a path down uh, a science physics uh, uh, direction and then uh, move moved away from that. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I agree with Meg. I mean, it's it is um, pretty wild to me that OSTP also, like only employs like 40 people full time um, who are really like intensely important civil servant like that are doing the work of the federal government. And many of us, myself included, believe that OSTP should maybe have a larger role and setting government-wide policy. Uh, my own interest in, in you know, physics and physics policy um, came, I think, more from like politics, um, getting involved. And I started graduate school um, right during the like Occupy Wall Street um, movement, like in 2008 and 2009. And that was really my first introduction to the way that the government worked. Um, and so I wanted to get involved and 
you know, make the world a better place, right? Like I really thought that there were a lot of things wrong with the way that the government approached different pieces of policy. Um, and then in parallel, I was in this very well-funded, well-organized lab. Um, so I was going to these protests and like dealing with overall U.S. fiscal policy and, and learning about that. And then at the same time, I was spending hundreds of thousands of dollars doing research. So my interest was like, how did those things overlap? Like, what was the history um, and why does the government spend as much as it does um, on scientific research? What's the government's interest in um, funding research, especially physics research? Um, and then more exploratory, like what was my own place in this system? Like, why was my research position funded? Um, why was the government funding it? How on earth did the government start funding um, many, many different research programs within, you know, lots of different scientific areas. So yeah, it, it was more like political activism, I guess. I wanted to know like um, how, how the government operated and how it approached science and why. Excellent, thank you both. Um, another question that we got ahead of the webinar uh, is, what is the best way to secure an environmental policy job within the federal government? For me, and I think this is true for, for both agencies as well as definitely for the Hill, um, there, you know, Dr. Evans mentioned some fellowships. I think those fellowships are an incredible opportunity um, as well as internships. So, um, you know, I, as I said, I began my career doing an internship on Capitol Hill, which is a fancy way of saying that I worked for free for a summer and then worked at Georgetown Hospital at night. And, you know, I think that it, um, especially for you all at your level of, um, and with the student loans that you may have, uh, working for free for a month or two may not sound feasible, um, but I think that that is often a way to start there are, Capitol Hill is not very organized. I hope it's gotten better in terms of sort of meeting people and creating a resource of resumes. It's constantly flipping and churning. Some people stay forever. Appropriators, the staff and the appropriations committees tend to stay for a long time because our work is um, very interesting and very precise. And it's sort of, it's hard to leave because who else would want to do this 24 hour a day job? Um, but, you know, if you're an intern, there's a phrase in D.C., today's intern is tomorrow's chief of staff. So that is often a, a really good way to, to get a start. And then, but there are opportunities where you can just, you know, apply directly to a member of Congress or to a committee and, and answer opportunities that come up. Thank you. Anything you want to add to that, Dr. Evans? No, I think Meg covered it. Um, I, you know, I, I'd highlighted the fellowships earlier. They're probably a small um, kind of uh, representative sample of what's out there. Um, I, I, the fellowships are nice because there's a community there. Um, there's usually a you know AAAS, the American Association for Advancement of Science, has expanded significantly over the last 10 years and in, in placing people both in Congress and the rest of the executive branch. It used to be very, very selective. It's still very competitive, um, but they there's a higher accept. It's not like getting into Harvard Med School anymore. It's like there's there's more positions available for for recent PhDs that want to learn about policy and be engaged like um, in, in Washington. So um, but there, there are likely others. Um, so, yeah. Um, a one, uh, I had a, I had a slide up there in case there's undergraduates. I had a student last year um, start at uh, the Science and Technology Policy Institute. She, uh, which is run through the Institute of Defense Analysis. It's a, it's a FFRDC. It's a federally funded research and development center. Um, and they're funded almost entirely by the federal government to do studies. She's having a very uh, interesting time, um, but they're, they're basically a think tank for the government. Um, that's an opportunity for undergraduates that really are interested in policy and have a technical background. Um, but I, I would say there's no short, you know, the US government is by slim margin anyway, the largest employer of 
recent PhDs in scientific fields. Um, so there's there's opportunities available, but the, the AAAS and other professional societies do provide like a community and a network of people that you can rely on to like learn more about how Washington works. Um, I'm clueless. I'm in Houston. I never worked in Washington. So I'm like a very far removed academic, very clueless about the way that Washington operates. But so we're, you want to be we're a good combination. Dr. Evans can tell you how things should work. And then I can <laughs> tell you how things do and don't work. Yeah. But I will say that there are more opportunities in DC for scientists than you would think. I mean, I will say um, a classic phrase that a a very conservative member of the House Science Committee said to me is, we need you, we, meaning he, the member of Congress, needed you, speaking to me as a lobbyist, to bring in your clients and their data and their information, not their values. He's like, this building is full of people with values. He's like, but we rely on your scientific data. So I think, you know, Although I mentioned in my slides that NSF is not adequately funded, science is still something that, you know, behind closed doors, you know, there was a lot of decrying science and during COVID, was it true, was it not true to mask or not to mask? It was really awful from a political standpoint. But behind closed doors, the members of Congress rally around science and the Republicans especially are very quick to fund scientific research, which is, I think, not what most people would think. So there is a, a real need for and, and, and value placed on scientific experts on Capitol Hill. That's nice to know. And, and I want to welcome Tacey, who, who joined us a little bit late, and she is actually uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. Do you want to do you want to end end our webinar series today? I mean, sure. And I'm actually not quite there yet, but I will be. Okay. Um, and I just wanted to make a note that uh, the for people interested, at least in fellowship opportunities, like Dr. Evans mentioned, uh, at least on more on the oceanographic side, we do have a webinar at the end of the series in December. I think it's on December sixth, but we'll have a few representatives from some of the bigger oceanography policy sort of fellowship opportunities or programs for people that are interested in sort of hearing about some of those that they can look forward to applying in the spring and things like that. Um, but thank you guys for coming. I'm so sorry I was not here for the majority. I was in the midst of my placement interviews for my Canals Fellowship. And so I've heard a lot of this information today as well. And Another it's, great it's really fellowship. Nice yes. It's, it's thank you so much for all your work to put it together, Tacey. You were awesome. Yes, of of course, and I'm very happy and I'm really excited that this is sort of moving forward and I hope that we can maybe collaborate on future events for students that are interested as well and sort of absolutely absolutely going. as long as as long as somebody out there can find a way for my 14 not to come in and demand my attention during the, this is the problem with, <laughs> with, with working from home. <laughs> when my, when my girls were younger, it was easier. <laughs> mm. Yes, pets are the second the second sort of issue right but they're always so cute to see so it's okay we, we all understand well thank you everybody for all of your great uh work to get us here today and and to meg for her presentation and dr evans for yours we really appreciate you sharing your knowledge experience and skills with uh, the next generation and for those of you who are still uh signed on to the webinar thank you for attending and we'll see you in a couple of weeks.